let's see what happens. So we are live now? Yes. Yeah, I guess. Yep. That's what it says on my system. Yes, we are live. Now we, I have to check that we are live in a right link or not. So uh, Priyanka, can you do that? That uh, link we have provided to all the attendees? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, I will also confirm within two, one minutes. I need to log into YouTube. So we let's begin, Soma. I lost her from the Zoom link. You are, uh, I can hear you, uh, Soma, I guess, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, Soma will be there, but sometime I think Soma will uh, continue with, with in this system. So Okay. Can you see me? No, we can't see you. Okay, oh, the video is good. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're live and we will start recording. Okay, so I welcome all of our, our viewers, Bangin viewers, on this platform. It is built for plant science research and promotion. And uh, fr from here, scientists and researchers can present their research to the world, and future scientists can gain knowledge, perspective, and inspiration. We do this through our webinar series, interview sessions, and publications. Thank you for being a part of Bangin. Uh, as more people are joining in, let me provide some housekeeping information related to today's webinar. Please note that after attending today's talk, you can apply for a certificate of participation. For this, you need to submit the feedback form that will be provided multiple times in the YouTube chat after the presentation. When you fill out the form, please use the same email address that you used during the registration and remember to mention your full institute name and address. Mismatch in email IDs may result in non-identification of participants and your certificate may not be issued. You can collect your participation certificates after two to three days from our BioEngine website. Please make sure that you have enabled YouTube chat in your device and you can, question, you can write your questions there and we will collect them for our speakers during the question answer round. Okay, so uh, Priyanka, I will now request you to please uh, carry on and uh, move forward this event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Soma. So before I invite Professor Welzil for his presentation, it's my great pleasure to give his formal introduction. Dr. Francois Welzil is a full professor of crop genomics in the Department of Plant Science at University Laval, Quebec City, Canada. He has more than 35 years of research experience he completed his PhD degree from UC Davis, California, USA, and postdoctoral training at the John Innes Center uh, in the UK. After, the, uh, after that, Professor Belgi launched his career as a researcher in molecular plant genetics at his alma mater at University Laval. During the first 10 years of his career, his work focused primarily on DNA repair and recombination genes in the model plant Arabidopsis. Over the last 20 years, Professor Belgi Lab has been interested in using genomics to develop novel approaches in plant breeding, mainly in soybean and barley. 
He has served as the foundation for the Soya Gene Project. Professor Velji aims to act as a bridge and facilitator between the lab-based genomic science and their numerous applications in the development of new and improved crop varieties. Professor Velji and his team are working closely with the industry partners to jointly develop and implement genomic, genomics informed breeding program. He was honored with the ADRIC and NSCRC awards in the recognition for his research and its benefit for society. Based on Google Scholar, he has been cited more than 6,500 times and has an uh, H index uh, 42. We are highly honored and happy to receive him as our guest speaker for today's webinar on tra translational genomics in soybean how genomic information can be made relevant to breeders. With this brief introduction, I request Professor Valjil to kindly share his screen and begin his talk. Over to you, Professor Valjil. Thank you, Priyanka, for the, uh, well, first for the invitation to speak before this group. I hope that uh, if you can give me a thumbs up to show that uh, the screen is uh, showing properly uh, my slides, that's uh, great. And so basically, uh, I, again, thank you for this opportunity. And what I'll try to do is, is give you a bit of a tour uh, of what we've been working on in, in soybeans for the last uh, five, seven years, basically, and how uh, hopefully this will uh, lead to uh, new tools that breeders can use to develop better varieties. And so just to contextualize a bit, so the soygen Team. So Soyagen is the name of a project that was funded uh, by Genome Canada, which is the main um, agency that funds genomic work in various living organisms in Canada. And basically the team was composed of 10 researchers that I had the pleasure of co-leading with my colleague and friend, uh, Richard Bélanger. And there were among this uh, set of 10 researchers four breeders, because that was really to reflect the, uh, the, the importance that we gave to making sure we were interacting closely with breeders to always be aware of their needs and trying to make the, the research outcomes to be most relevant for uh, applied research, basically. And so, in, the, in this particular context, we were uh, tasked with defining what were some of the key um, challenges that needed to be met by soybean research in Canada. And as you can, I'm sure, imagine, Canada is not exactly the most natural place to be growing soybeans simply because it's such a northerly country. And so earliness uh, in terms of maturity is always a key issue for Canadian growing conditions. Finding lines that are very, very early is possible, but having lines that combine uh, an adequate yield to make this a profitable crop, now that's a combination that's harder to come by, and that was one of the, uh, the main focus areas of this research. And as any crop uh, that gains importance in an area, there are going to be challenges with regards to different pests and pathogens. And so we identified a set of three uh, such enemies of the crop that were uh, of uh, significance. So you see them illustrated on the bottom. So Phytophthora soje, the soybean cyst nematode, Heterodera glycines, and Sclerotinia sclerotiorum as three main uh, uh, path, uh, disease problems, if you will. And finally, a more of a sociological issue, if you will, uh, about grower adoption. So Western Canada is the main area where many of the crops, uh, large scale agriculture is conducted in the, in the plant sphere. Um, wheat, canola, chickpea, lentils, uh, these are all carried out on, on fairly large areas. And soybean is a fairly novel crop in these areas. And we had to understand what were some of the limitations in terms of grower adoption. And so that made up the main uh, thrust of this work. And so this, through this uh, means that we were able to conduct much of the work that I'll be describing today. Now, just to sort of illustrate the um, context or how we viewed um, how these different parts of the work were integrated, I borrowed from Mike Bevan from a few years ago, a, a review paper that they published about 
how different sequencing technologies could best be used. And they symbolized it as, as a pyramid. And I uh, modified their, their scheme to essentially illustrate how we viewed the different parts of the work that I'll be uh, presenting today as being integrated. And so the foundation of uh, a lot of the work that we do is really to do uh, an extensive characterization of the genetic diversity that's present in relevant germplasm. And once we have this as a basis, then we can move on to try to define haplotypes. And sometimes these correspond to alleles for genes. And this is really uh, very significant information for breeders. And building on this again, we can use these resources to perform gene or QTL discovery, either through GWAS or traditional biparental QTL mapping. And again, hopefully this will lead to uh, useful markers that can be used in breeding. And in, in this sense, we, we have really two types of applications, either marker assisted selection that I'm sure you're aware of, but I'll be speaking today more about genomic prediction approaches, which use a broader set of markers for more, um, less focused goals, if you will. And so with that in mind, I'll start by uh, describing some of the uh, work that was done in terms of trying to characterize the genetic diversity in uh, soybeans, certainly at least for, for Canadian accessions. And so to put this into context, uh, we have to remember that there are different types of genetic variation that are encountered when we compare the genomes of different varieties or accessions of any crop species or plant or whatever. And obviously what we hear most about are the single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs that are illustrated on the left, where basically a single uh, difference, a single nucleotide uh, is the difference between one and the other um, line at that particular uh, position in the genome. And what is, uh, however, less well studied is structural variation illustrated on the right, where these are larger scale differences that uh, distinguish one accession and another. And so just to take a, a quick example, so if your reference genome is essentially um, carrying a region that is absent from a sample that you're studying, then we'll say that that sample carries a deletion relative to the reference sequence. And so these are, are again, larger scale variants that uh, can be of significance in explaining uh, phenotypic variation. And another area that I want to just briefly um, go over is uh, when we talk about sequencing a genome, because people often talk about sequencing a genome, and it actually means two different things. Um, so in one of its uses, I think a, a more complete uh, reference would be to, or, or, or referral would be to say that we perform reference genome assembly. And so in this particular sense, um, sequencing a genome means extremely deep sequencing where every single position in the genome can be sequenced hundreds of times uh, using oftentimes many different sequencing technologies and other tools, basically to be able to take uh, uh, mounds of information and to perform very complex analysis to be able to stitch all these pieces together into basically what will be the set of chromosomes and 20 chromosomes in soybean. And once we have these assemblies, then it's an exhaustive capture of genetic diversity as both SNPs and structural variation uh, can be uh, derived by comparing uh, the genomes of two different accessions. The other meaning when we talk about sequencing a genome is really resequencing, which is a, a much more shallow uh, approach where we aim to only sequence a few times uh, each of the nucleotide positions in the genome. And its main focus is really only or mainly to capture SNPs. So it's a much cheaper endeavor, but it, it can be carried out on a much broader scale in terms of the number of accessions that are characterized. And so when we think about some of the major advances that have occurred in the last years, 
as in a number of areas in biology, the decreasing cost of sequencing has really meant that we've been able to do a lot more work uh, and, and achieve uh, greater outcomes. And just to illustrate uh, uh, how this has been revolutionary, the soybean genome is about 1 billion base pairs, so 1 gigabase in size. And when we're performing resequencing, so the shallow sort of sequencing that I alluded to earlier, we're really aiming at sequencing maybe a tenfold uh, coverage of the genome. So a total amount of, of sequencing effort that comes to about 10 gigabases. And in today's world, um, this now costs fairly trivial amounts of money, certainly less than $100 than to resequence a soybean line at that level. And this is, you know, when I look back 30 years ago, that would have been just blown our minds to think that you could sequence a complete genome for, this, for such a trivial amount. And when you, we were first uh, working, people were first working on assembling the human genome when they tallied the cost, uh, various estimates have been provided, but certainly uh, above $3 billion to sequence and assemble a complete human genome. So it just shows that there's been a tremendous uh, improvement in terms of the technological tools that are uh, at hand to, to do this type of work. And so in terms of uh, looking at what has happened specifically in soybeans, so in the last few years, there's been a tremendous amount of work uh, by numerous groups uh, around the world, including our own, to characterize or capture the genetic diversity in a broad array of accessions that can include both uh, the cultivated soybean or domesticated soybean, glycine max, and its wild relatives of glycine soja. And at, at current uh, date, we have over 4,000 of these accessions or lines that have been resequenced again to a, a, a more shallow depth, but enough to give us a good idea of the genetic diversity that's present within the species and its very close relative. So if we look at inside the cultivated uh, soybean, uh, we find that we reach a, a plateau of about 15 million SNPs. And so that's the extent basically of the diversity that's been captured in broad collections <clears throat> of cultivated soybean. Now that may sound a lot, but you have to think about the size of the genome, which is one gigabase. And so this is 0.15%. And so one in 600 nucleotides in the soybean genome is variable. So that means that 599 of the, those 600 are invariable. And so it gives you uh, uh, maybe I think a better view uh, of the extent of variation or, or relatively low level of variation found in the soybean genome compared to some other major crops where this can be certainly uh, a higher proportion. If we look at the broader situation in the glycine max, glycine soja context, so including now these wild relative, this wild relative of soybean, looking at many accessions of this wild relative, there's certainly 30 to 35 million SNPs that have been characterized. And so obviously, as one would expect when you extend the range of your analysis of genetic diversity, you uh, end up finding more diversity uh, in this case, uh, in the soybean complex. The other aspect that I was uh, alluding to earlier in terms of characterizing genetic diversity is to look at uh, how this variation is reflected in terms of structural variation. And so new sequencing technologies and not just the reduction in costs have facilitated the assembly of reference genomes. So really very deep sequencing, multiple technologies and complex assembly. And we now have over 35, what are considered high quality assembled genomes of GMAX and GSOJA. And they offer a much more complete view of all of the variation that's present. So in addition to the SNPs that I described earlier, here you have a view of a genomic region on uh, a, a soybean chromosome one, uh, chromosome three, I'm sorry. And you can see that in this particular region, if you compare different accessions, well, basically they have almost identical gene content. So the arrowheads represent 
of different colors represent different genes. And you see that essentially it's the same catalog of genes and they're ordered, organized in the same fashion. Now this is one region of chromosome three. If I look in another region, now I see a slightly different picture where some genes are present in some accessions, but seem to be absent in others. And there is more um, diversity in how the genomes are organized. And so this gives us an example of the, the, the value and the power of having these assembled genomes that allow us to see which regions are very highly conserved and which regions are more variable. And so these are really uh, very nice tools to have. And this is the result of a, a extensive work by a Chinese group that was published last year. So we've established, I think, that you know, through the advances in genomics, we've accumulated really very, very large amounts of genetic data. And that's in itself obviously a good thing. But the question we're really concerned with is how can we use this information to essentially help in developing better soybean varieties for growers. And so going back to my pyramid, this allows us really to say, well, we've established the ground floor here of our pyramid with all of this data. And now let's see how we can try to exploit it to make it more useful. And the first step that I think that we were among the pioneers in terms of viewing things in this way was really to focus on defining haplotypes. So groups of SNPs that basically are inherited jointly um, simply because of their proximity on the, the, in the genome. And oftentimes finding that these haplotypes could help us define alleles at genes. And, and in traditional genetics, obviously, you know, Mendelian genetics, well, alleles are really what are uh, help define the uh, different functional variation for genes. And so again, the challenge, if, if I accrue this huge catalog of SNP data and um, this is what I do, generate this type of data, and breeders on the, hand, on the other hand are developing uh, data that takes the form of what's shown on the right where they have different traits or for different lines or accessions, they will have different values for these traits. That's what they're used to working with. And so the question becomes, well, how do we ensure that these two types of data uh, become relevant one to the other? And that's, that's really uh, seeing that uh, basically if I just give breeders a catalog of SNP data, for most breeders, that won't be really very helpful or useful. And so that's what we're trying to find is ways to make this data more meaningful. And so one, way to do this is to look at the impact that some of these SNPs may have on the function of a gene. And the most extreme case is when a mutation or a SNP, a variant, leads to a loss of function. So you can imagine a case illustrated on the left where you have a gene, and when that gene is, is transcribed and translated to its full extent, um, it leads to the fully functional normal protein. Now, if a SNP happens to introduce a premature stop codon in the coding region of a gene, well, that will result in the production of a truncated protein. And if the protein is truncated enough or has lost some essential domains to its function, well, this protein is no longer functional. And so, we're able using uh, bioinformatic tools to examine where SNPs are located, what predicted impact they have on the coding region of a gene, and therefore to say, well, there's a good chance that this SNP will lead to uh, a difference in function. And so we did this on a large collection of soybean lines. I think it was 1,007 accessions. And we were able to look at different genes and say, can we find among this set of soybean lines uh, some where there is a contrast where some lines have what would be the wild type allele? And here these are all uh, shown in the, the red or pink boxes. And others carry a defective allele, an allele that is predicted to produce a defective protein, a loss of function 
mutation, and those are uh, in, illustrated in blue. So in these cases, we were able to, to, we had phenotypic data for these lines and could ask the question, is there a significant difference in phenotype between lines that carry the wild type allele of this gene and lines that carry a mutant version or carrying a SNP that is predicted to alter function. And you see the names of the genes on, on the bottom. So on the left, FAD3 is a gene involved in uh, fatty acid synthesis. And as you can see, well, lines that had the wild type allele had a high linolenic acid content and lines that were defective or produce what is likely a defective enzyme uh, had a much reduced uh, content in linolenic acid. And you can see the same sort of significant contrast being illustrated for these different genes. And so if a breeder is looking for a line that is, let's say, uh, producing less linolenic acid, has uh, earlier, smaller, you know, greater grain weight or, or, or earlier maturity, then they can uh, look for these mutations that basically have strong phenotypic impact on uh, genes that are of interest to them. So one way, this is one way where you have very, very uh, uh, significant changes happening, but more often than not, SNPs will have more subtle effects on uh, the function of a gene. And so again, we're back to our initial challenge is how do we convert or translate large amounts of SNP data into information that's more directly relevant to breeders. And we developed a tool that we call haplotype minor, which basically attempts to look at the vicinity of a gene and to identify SNPs that are helpful in defining different haplotypes and hopefully help us define alleles at that gene. And so we started this work many years ago working on uh, maturity genes because those are of significant interest to breeders in Canada. And without you know, focusing too uh, specifically on any of the written information, just look at for the general pattern. So what you see here is the E1 gene is the yellow bar. And so we're looking at SNPs that are surrounding this uh, gene that's important for maturity. So each of the rows defines a SNP that is in the vicinity of this gene. And what you can see, if you simply look at the pattern of colors, is there are different patterns that emerge. For example, on the extreme left, you see that all six SNPs that flank the E1 uh, gene have a, a blue color to them. It doesn't mean anything specific, it's just to, to dis distinguish alleles. And you see that this is the only accession that has this unique combination of alleles or haplotype. We called it haplotype A. And we found that this particular haplotype corresponded to the wild type late conferring allele of the gene E1. And then if you look at the next, you see that there's a, a, a group of uh, a different uh, a new haplotype that's defined. It corresponds to another allele and so on and so forth. So the gist here is that we identified six different haplotypes among this set of accessions. And each of these haplotypes corresponded to a single allele. And so each haplotype could clearly indicate which of the alleles was present in this collection. And so then that allows us to study uh, or, or to understand how uh, maturity in a given line is conditioned by the, the fact of having one or the other allele at this particular gene. And so we're able to do this uh, using the same approach on all four of the um, known genes that are key controllers of maturity in soybeans since uh, other genes have been identified. But at the time, these were the only four genes known to or cloned that had uh, impact on maturity. And so basically you can see the counts here where for each allele of each gene, we identify which uh, accessions had one or the other allele. And so basically for a given accession or line of soybean, we can know its exact composition in terms of what alleles 
it carries for these four different maturity genes. And this is the type of information that uh, was not available to breeders prior to this sort of technology, which is akin to basically maybe performing an X-ray and seeing, well, what's inside uh, the genetic makeup of this line and how can it potentially impact the uh, phenotype that we see in the field? And now that we're able to decipher what was uh, the maturity package that is found inside each line, we can assess how this would uh, translate in the field. And so we performed this experiment where we defined um, different maturity packages, so combinations of alleles at these four different maturity genes. And we have five lines, each having the same maturity package. And we trialed these lines across eight different sites in across Canada and ranging across 10 degrees of latitude, which is quite considerable. And so to assess which maturity package was best adapted to each uh, area where soybeans were being grown or considered for uh, cropping. And so again, without looking into the details, you see on the left, the different combinations of alleles that are present. And on the right, uh, the heat map, you see um, the, the result of these trials and where you see the dark red in the sort of bottom right, those are cases where these lines never matured on these sites. And so these are cases where clearly these combinations of alleles at these maturity genes were completely unsuitable. And so that was basically guiding breeders and saying, well, if you're aiming to produce soybean in this region, what are the best combinations of alleles that you be, should be assembling in your varieties? And so this is an example where I showed that this was carried out on maturity genes. Now we went uh, further and basically uh, once we had whole genome sequencing information on a thousand soybean lines, we were able to run our algorithm, this haplotype minor, on all 55,000 soybean genes to try and basically define haplotypes with the hope that oftentimes these would correspond to alleles. And so the uh, graph on the left shows you what we call gene-centric haplotypes. So haplotypes centered around genes. So we're focusing our attention on a gene, looking at its what are the SNPs inside and around it, and this helps us define haplotypes. And you can see the distribution where some genes have relatively few haplotypes and others have more. And the question then becomes, well, how relevant is this information? And we go back to one of our maturity genes that we have studied and know very well. And so this is an example where basically this analysis told us that we, had, we could define three gene-centric haplotypes and these correspond basically to the three known alleles at the E2 gene. And among the thousand lines, you can see the breakdown, the frequency on the right, showing which allele is common, which allele is more rare. And so basically, if a breeder is looking for a line that carries a specific allele of the E2 gene, now they have a resource where they can go shopping for the particular accession that carries the allele that they're interested in. So once uh, again, we, we've been able to leverage uh, this large amount of information to carry out these sorts of global analyses, we were also interested in uh, doing some gene mapping. So breeders always have traits of interest that they would like to have a better understanding of what controls these traits. And all this information can be highly useful for that. And so I'll focus now on some of the mapping work that was done. And so in today's world, uh, oftentimes uh, genome-wide association analyses, so GWAS are, are really, uh, is really the tool of choice to uh, decipher or to uh, determine where the uh, genetic underpinnings of a trait. And so we had assembled a core set of Canadian lines that were representative of the uh, germplasm in use by Canadian breeders. And we had a few million SNPs that had been filtered 
and were uh, 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 well distributed throughout the genome to help us uh, find the define the regions that were uh, useful in these uh, determining these traits. And so we have been characterizing quite a wide uh, diversity of such traits, uh, some that are of uh, obvious relevance to breeders, such as maturity, things like lodging resistance. We've looked at seed composition traits. Uh, protein and oil obviously are, are very high on the list of interesting characters. More and more, there's interest in, interest in looking at the specific composition in terms of amino acids, uh, as especially in soybean, where uh, tofu making, for example, is very highly dependent on being able to having a, a good content in sulfur containing amino acids that helps uh, uh, basically produce the tofu and then major mineral elements. And more recently, we've been looking at some root system architecture traits. So in the, in the context of climate change and increasing uh, challenges uh, due to the climate, uh, we felt that it was useful to, to cast our, uh, to examine some underground traits such as root length and, and root number. And you see on, on the right, the two images of two contrasting soybean varieties. And I think uh, you can see very well that uh, uh, different soybean varieties have different strategies in terms of how they uh, develop their root systems. Uh, and, and these are things that we're interested in looking at. And just to give a few examples of how uh, our ability to uh, identify regions of interest has progressed over the years, I'll go back almost uh, 10 years ago and share on the left the result of a genome-wide association study we'd carried out for, in this case, oil content in soybean seed, at the time, uh, we were working with a much smaller catalog of SNPs. You can see 17,000 SNPs used in this analysis. But nonetheless, this had allowed us to define regions of the genome that were basically associated with um, oil content. Now, with the greater amount of sequencing information, um, the amount of SNPs that we had for this collection increased significantly. And you can see now looking at one specific uh, region that uh, uh, this has increased our resolution quite dramatically. So on the image on the right, the red dots represent the original markers that we had uh, from the study uh, illustrated on the left. And the uh, dark dots represent basically new SNPs that came through uh, a deeper uh, genotyping analysis. And what you can see is that in this region, we can still find association with the original uh, markers. So the red dot, see that pointing, that used to be our peak SNP, if you will. And now with these additional uh, markers, you can see a much increased uh, association, so a tighter association, and a much uh, narrower window in terms of where genes of interest could lie. And very satisfying for us, we could see that there was a, a, a homolog of the Arabidopsis NPC1 gene, one which has been demonstrated functionally in Arabidopsis to control oil content. So it doesn't take much imagination to figure that uh, likely this soybean homolog is also involved in determining oil content and would explain the signal that we see on the end of this chromosome. And so this is the type of increased resolution and better mechanistic understanding that we can achieve through this denser marker coverage. Another example comes from this disease uh, study where we uh, had trialed our collection of uh, soybean lines for tolerance or resistance to sclerotinia. And we had found uh, basically a signal on chromosome uh, 15, but by redoing the analysis, which a much better coverage of the genome, we found a, a stronger association on chromosome one, one in which the markers that were significantly associated with the trait belong to a single haplotype block and within which there was a single candidate gene. Unfortunately, there's not much that's known about this gene. 
Uh, and so it's, we don't know yet how it can impact uh, disease resistance, but obviously it's amenable to strategies such as CRISPR uh, to basically knock out the gene and see what happens and by what mechanism it has an impact on disease resistance. And so these are successful cases where basically by having sufficient, a sufficient number of SNPs in the genome, we're able to find what are either causal genes or very strong candidates for causal genes. But this may not always be the case. So many of the allelic variants that are used in, in a breeding program are not necessarily inside genes or not in coding regions. For example, they can be uh, regulatory mutations that will alter the timing or the strength of expression of a gene. Now, if a SNP uh, that we capture through whole genome sequencing is the causal variant, meaning it is the one that leads to this altered regulation of the gene, well, it's still a highly interesting variant because it's the one that will remain perfectly associated with the phenotype because it's the cause of that phenotype. But it may not be as easy to identify, well, what gene is uh, being altered in this uh, situation. It may not be a gene that's just nearby, maybe elsewhere, and therefore to gain a better understanding of the mechanism involved. Another situation that can occur is that actually it's not the, the, the cause of the, uh, the genetic cause of variation is not a SNP. For example, it could be due to structural variation. And so if we have a SNP that is tightly, tightly associated with the causal variant, so the causal SV, then that SNP is still very useful. But what if we don't have a SNP that is in perfect association? And this is, these are situations that do occur. And so that uh, led us to want to look more closely at structural variation as a contributor to phenotypic variation. And so one of the uh, um, challenges with uh, using structural variants is that uh, they can be quite difficult to uh, characterize. So you remember when we're doing a lot of this sequencing, most of the sequencing effort is used, uh, is, is obtained through short reads. And so typically because of their small size, they have a hard time uh, helping us uncover uh, larger structural variants. And all these analyses oftentimes uh, rely on fairly complex uh, bioinformatic inferences. And it's possible uh, that oftentimes uh, our lists of structural variants that are discovered using these tools are likely incomplete and imprecise. And without going into, uh, again, too much detail, um, showing again some of the uh, differences or, or types of structural variants that we're seeking to characterize using these bioinformatic tools. And there are different approaches that can be used to do this. And without, again, uh, delving into the details here, if we just look at the first one that is an approach called read depth, um, just looking for read coverage. And so if you have a reference genome that's illustrated on the top, and let's say that a region, the, the orange region, is absent from the sample, well, there will be no reads corresponding to that region that will be found inside the sample that you're sequencing. And you will infer from that that this particular sample is bears a deletion of this particular region. So this region is absent from this sample. Now, conversely, if you look at the blue region, it's present as a single copy uh, in the reference. But if you have an exceptionally deep coverage of this region in the sample, that would lead you to surmise that basically this region is present in more than one copy in the sample relative to the reference. And we would, in that case, possibly talk about a duplication. So it's just to show how we can um, extract meaning from short reads and interpret that as being the sign, the possible sign 
of structural variants such as deletions, duplications, and their much more complex situations that are illustrated in the other technologies or approaches to calling structural variants. So we uh, did this type of analysis a few years ago on uh, what we had this Canadian uh, lines that we had resequenced using uh, Illumina reads. And this gives you a summary table of what types of structural variants were found, what was the range of sizes of these structural variants, the median size, and a relative uh, precision in terms of defining the actual beginning and end of a structural variant. So there's about 90,000 variants that were found. And what you can see is the very predominant categories are deletions and insertions. And so although these range quite widely in terms of size from just as few as 10 base pairs to many mega bases, uh, you can see that the median size is actually quite small with about 100, 150 base pairs being the median size of these uh, alterations to the genome. So these represent the vast majority of structural variants that were found by, again, examining uh, short reads. One thing that may strike you is that there are about four times more deletions than insertions. And this is something that's unexpected because what we call a deletion or insertion is strictly a convention. It depends on what is being considered the reference. And you would expect basically in principle that there would be as many deletions that there are insertions as there's an equal chance of a sequence being present or absent in one or the other line. And so this was telling us directly that, well, the tools we were using and the type of reads that were available to us were not doing a very good job of fully capturing structural variants because we would have expected these numbers to be equal, essentially. And so we surmised that we were under discovering or not fully discovering all of the insertions that were present simply for, again, technical reasons. More, uh, so then you can ask, well, you know, this is a fairly limited number of variants. If you look at this same set of lines of about 100 accessions, we could call about 5 million SNPs and small indels insertion deletions in this set. So that's a very large number compared to less than 100,000 variants of structural variants. And so one might think, well, you know, SNPs are the big players and structural variants are less important. But if you look at the genes that are predicted to have uh, uh, lost their function due to this type of uh, one or the other type of mutation, you see, in fact, that structural variants, because each one is much bigger, they have a much larger functional impact uh, individually, if you will. So in the soybean, over 10,000 genes were predicted to be impacted uh, by a structural variant, whereas these millions of SNPs uh, were having a more limited uh, impact on uh, gene function. And so that really, again, stresses uh, the importance of looking at structural variants. Um, sorry, I have to, okay, we'll go back. So my conclusion is that although um, they are far less abundant than SNPs, structural variants are still a very, very significant contributor to functional variation in soybean. And so we wanted to develop an approach that would allow us to more accurately genotype, uh, characterize structural variants in soybean. So as I mentioned earlier, it's inherently a difficult task using only short read sequences. And so we really broke it down into two different aspects, one being the discovery of structural variants. So finding regions of the genome that are present, absent, uh, altered in one accession versus another, uh, looking where the, the structural variant starts, where it ends, the length, what's in the sequence that's changing between one and the other. So that's what we call discovery of structural variants. The other aspect is the actual genotyping of structural variants. So calling, does this line have this deletion, yes or no? So that's really the question we're asking there. And so what we did is we used long read sequencing, which is still relatively costly, 
to go, do a better job of discovering structural variants on a subset of lines that uh, were of interest to us, and then use the more extensive short read data on the full set of lines to perform the genotyping to answer the question, is this structural variant present, absent from uh, each line? And so basically this is a, a summary of some of the work that pu was published earlier this year. And I'll spare you some of the, the technical details on top, but just looking at the table on the bottom. And so we broke down uh, deletions and insertions into different size categories because uh, depending on the size of the variant, it may be more or less challenging to discover uh, these uh, variants. And what you can see is that using this hybrid approach, we're able to successfully uh, identify and call over 90 to 95% of the deletions that we had uncovered through long read sequencing. And if you look at insertions, you see it's lower, but it's not it's much improved compared to what it was earlier, where it would have been uh, maybe 25%, basically, because we were discovering only one fourth the number of insertions relative to deletions. And so although it's not, again, 100%, it's still uh, a good increase in our capacity to identify and to call the presence or absence of these insertions. So, how much will this work on structural variants be uh, useful in identifying causal variation? Unfortunately, at this time, we don't have a definitive answer in soybean, but a couple of weeks ago, a very extensive piece of work was published in Tomato where it sheds light on this question. And, and what struck me very, very deeply is their conclusion that structural variants actually were the type of variant that contributed the most to heritability. So defining to the genetically defined uh, uh, portion of variation for a trait. So 66% of uh, the variation, the heritability could be ascribed to the structural variants among a very large set of traits. Now, most of these 20,000 traits are things like uh, gene expression using arrays and stuff, but still it's, it's, it's a very, large number of traits. As I was mentioning earlier, um, if we have a SNP that's in strong LD with a structural variant, maybe we don't need to define the structural variant and just rely on the SNP as a proxy to uncover or uh, the, the, to find that association. So the good news was that over 60% of their structural variants were in relatively strong LD with at least one SNP. And so that provides some hope that the SNPs are still quite useful in helping one to uh, find associations with that. But the, um, conversely, there were relatively few structural variants that were in perfect LD with uh, a SNP. And so it says that uh, SNPs will not always be uh, uh, very, very, very tightly, perfectly associated with a structural variant. And so if the situation uh, turns out to be similar in soybean, well, it, it probably encourages us to, us to do a better job of uh, capturing these structural variants in order to enable us to better define uh, the causes, the root causes of the phenotypic variation that's relevant to breeders. And so in closing, I want to rapidly go over some of the work that we've done in trying to use uh, these extensive sets of markers for breeding. And as I alluded to in the beginning, I'm really not talking about marker assisted selection, which is a very well established technology, very widely used, but more in the area of genomic prediction. So trying to assess or predict the performance of a line based on its genetic makeup. And there are really two areas of application where we can see this being useful to breeders. One is to identify, well, which parents should I cross to make the, the, the best progeny? And then once a cross has been made among the progeny that are derived, which are the most promising progeny, again, based on their genetic makeup. Now, these technologies are widely used in, in large multinational seed companies, uh, but it's not in their nature to, to publish much of what they do. And so in the public sector, we're sort of uh, left in a position that we have to sort of uh, 
reinvent the wheel and, and sort of try to figure this out on our own uh, uh, in, in, along with our collaborators. And so if you think about what we're trying to achieve here is we're trying to build essentially a predictive model that will take a large amount of phenotypic data, field data for a given set of lines that are thought to be relevant and will have been trialed in various environments and years to get a good uh, capture of the phenotypic performance of these lines. And on the other hand, you have a very detailed genotypic analysis and you're trying basically to, to blend the two together and try to figure out how the genotype can be help, used to predict the phenotype. And so in one potential implementation that we've explored is to consider a broad set of potential crosses and based again on the genetic makeup of the parental lines to see which of these crosses would probably be a better bet in terms of producing superior progeny. And so this is something that we actually tried uh, with the help of our breeders, uh, collaborating breeders. And so we had a set of lines originally that if you considered all possible crosses generated over 60,000 potential crosses. Now, no breeder would ever consider or be able to, to contemplate such a large set of uh, potential crosses. And for each of these crosses, we then proceeded to predict what would be uh, the mean yield or the mean uh, maturity for the progeny of these different crosses. And you can see on the left, the graphs represent the realm of possibilities. And we'll go into more detail in the next few slides. So the black uh, area is basically the, the cloud of all possible crosses. And the colored dots represent crosses that were actually performed by breeders and for which we're able to assess whether or not our predictions uh, proved useful. And so this is really a key graph showing that for over 100 crosses that breeders did do, so they performed these crosses, the progeny of these crosses underwent the breeding process, selection, so rejecting poor lines, keeping better lines, and ultimately uh, entering elite advanced lines into registration trials or actually being commercialized. And so in this uh, uh, graph, we see how predicted mean it, uh, um, relates to predicted maturity, so yield versus maturity. And without surprise, they're highly correlated, meaning that later maturing lines tend to have higher yield and earlier lines tend to have lower yield. And that's, again, nothing very surprising. So if we draw the uh, line, the regression line, you can see that essentially all of the colored dots lie above the diagonal or the regression. And what this means is that basically these predicted yields and these uh, within different maturity windows of the superior crosses, they were always above average, essentially, with one exception. And crosses that we predicted to be relatively low yielding within the different maturity windows, these crosses tended not to produce any superior progeny that would make it into uh, advanced trials or commercialization. And so again, all but one of the crosses that did end up producing superior progeny, we had predicted to have above average yield within that frame of maturity and none of the crosses that we had predicted to be below average succeeded in producing advanced lines with high yield. So practically it would have been possible using this type of analysis to tell the breeders, well, half of these crosses don't bother doing them because they're not going to lead to any superior progeny. And so that could have a potentially very large impact on the efficiency of the breeding, the cost of the breeding program if you could get the same output with half the effort, basically. And so going back to this uh, scheme that I showed earlier, we've gone through all four different sections. And I hope that through doing this that uh, I've been able to illustrate at least how we think about using crop genomics to be uh, made helpful for the breeding endeavor.
And I'd like to really acknowledge the work of a number of students and, and, and research associates that were uh, highlighted in this presentation. And in closing, to uh, recognize the significant contributions of many funding agencies and, and, and the institutions that were involved in this work. And with that, I will thank you and be uh, happy to entertain questions that you might have on the topic. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, sir, for such such a great talk. Everybody loved it because you already mentioned the reason and your findings. Mentioned why you did that and uh, uh, your findings. So maybe that is the reason that we don't have so many questions related to your talk. So we wanted to go for the interactive round and give some time to the audience. And though. Those are wanted to ask you the questions related to subject things, or and then we come back with the, this uh, presentation later the talk. And um, the work is uh, so uh, so tremendous. Means you you uh, whole Canada you search for the where is the actual populations can grow and in that way. So uh, th that is the actual output i think uh, and th that when you relate the in silico and genomics data to the actual field conditions and here we can relate the both things means uh, it's a complete story now it's the time read and find the others variety and prove variety so i i appreciate your whole work is start so basic to so uh, uh, there is a lot of future perspectives you have created and try to solve each and every puzzles uh, as as the possible. That, and that I am, uh, and, and it is reflect on the our YouTube chat box. Everyone is happy with your presentation style. You mention why you did that and what is the result. So. You are great so teachers. Me, I, you know, I, 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 over the years, I, I've seen too many situations where um, genomics project, when they're put together, a claim that they will you know, have a yes. large impact on breeding, <laughs> and, and and genomicists sometimes will work in a silo mm -hmm. beside breeders, and they don't communicate, and so ah, yes. in, in the end, the 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 tools or, or there's a missing step, you know, they have all this data and they sort of expect the breeders to take it up. Uh, mm. I was trained as an agronomist and throughout my, my training was very closely involved with breeders. And so mm. I was, I guess, maybe uh, more sensitive to the needs that they may, might have. And so I've, I've tried to, to be a good uh, a bridge between those two communities because too often they just remain uh, separate and, and all this data is of very little use if they are enabled to, to use it in some useful fashion. And so I think there's still a, a tremendous amount of work to do to, to continue to bridge that gap between all these mounds of information and uh, how to best use it for the benefit of, well, obviously breeders, but eventually that means growers and eventually that means uh, everybody because that feeds the world basically. And sir, another thing I uh, wanted to ask you that you're in that uh, in that national level project in like Swajin, you have uh, run this project. Uh, what happened with that access and when you find that it is a valuable, is there any extra take care of this access and is made or it's just the depository and it can be lost anytime? So is there any uh, uh, project or your intention to uh, separate these accessions from a pool and make it more valuable, more accessible, and more distributed all over the world. Well, all of, all of these accessions that when we when we assembled the genetic materials that would be the focus of this study or these studies, uh, we emphasized that those accessions needed to be public. Um, yes, you know there's there's a big divide. Uh, between uh, GM varieties and non-GM varieties. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, the genetic makeup of a good GM line and a good non-GM line is actually very similar because you have to meet the same demands in terms of mm -hmm. uh, being adapted to early maturity and high yield and this disease resistance trait and all that. So we figured 
whatever we found in the non-GM arena, which was less subject to commercial you know, limitations in terms of uh, using materials and getting authorizations and all this and that, uh, we felt that would be useful. And so um, all the data that we generate, we uh, deposit in public databases. In our case, it's Soybase, which is held by the USDA. And so it's got a long standing record of you know, being able to freely distribute data. And all of the genetic materials that we're using are already uh, widely uh, used by, by breeders themselves. And so we're, we're hopeful that uh, uh, this will maximize the, the impact and usefulness of the uh, discoveries that are being made. But said, uh, the storage part, you not take care of by the, your uh, uh, fund. The data part, I understand, but the actual, the seeds, those are, those accessions that you found that it's a very good, and there is any others uh, uh, protective or any others uh, uh, preserves or seed bank like uh, steps from your project. Is there any? Yeah, we we don't planning? ourselves maintain any okay. sort of seed bank because these <laughs> varieties are are already part of okay. uh, different uh, soybean uh, <laughs> gene banks, and so you know we don't need to, to sort of replicate uh, that mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. And so basically, I think in terms of availability of research materials, be it the data themselves or the materials mm -hmm. themselves, I think that both are uh, readily available. Obviously, the materials that we work with on a regular basis, for example, our core set is something that you know we maintain throughout mm -hmm. the years. And if anybody uh, is interested in obtaining a line, these are things that we can uh, we can provide. Okay. Thank, thanks, sir. Uh, now I request Priyanka. Priyanka, please uh, go for the interactive round. And I uh, also request all the participants, please put your questions in YouTube chat box. I will collect for the uh, uh, in discussion sessions. Thanks, Priyanka. Okay. So I would like to acknowledge what Sri said, like your presentation was like more what you are doing, how you are doing, and how how you are implementing. So that is the like good bridge between basic to advanced uh, how it was implemented. So with this, uh, like we are uh, going to start now another session uh, called the interactive session. And here I would like to brief um, a bit. Uh, this session majorly focuses to encourage the master PhD student uh, or uh, early career researcher for their career uh, research pursuits, uh, especially from the developing countries. Uh, so the, uh, the section is uh, divided in two parts, kind of where the first part is covering like uh, more about your background, why you came to the plant science research. And the second would be like based on your, like your opinion for the like the very burning agricultural questions like global warming, climate change, and uh, follow up with the, your ethics and training for the next generation. So those kind of questions. So with this uh, um, note, I would like to start the very first interesting question. Please share your journey as a researcher with our viewers. Right. So I guess when I was, uh, you know, maybe uh, every educational system has its specifics in terms of when uh, young people are expected to need to make decisions about their professional future. And for me, this would have been... Uh, Somewhere in the later high school years, uh, I was uh, involved at home in, in, in growing a garden, being interested in plants and growing plants and understanding how they, they work. And so when came the time to choose a field of study in, uh, at university, then quite logically, I was attracted by the field of agronomy. Um, being a city person, it wasn't something that I was exposed to um, in terms of a direct interaction, you know, not, not being from a farming community, but uh, uh, as I went through my uh, undergraduate training, I was uh, more and more interested in, on the plant side rather than the animal side. And I was fortunate enough during my uh, undergraduate years in the summer to be hired as an assistant in what were essentially breeding programs. So I got involved fairly early on in uh, working 
you know, field plots, uh, working sometimes in the lab, doing microscopy, looking at chromosomes and things like that. And so I, I, I developed an interest in genetics and uh, applications of genetics in, in terms of breeding. And when came the time to envision graduate studies, this was in the mid eighties. And uh, I guess molecular genetics, so the study of DNA basically was really taking off. And it seemed that it would be a very uh, interesting field to me. I was very attracted by this area, even though I had no practical experience of it. And it uh, became obvious to me that uh, I needed to go somewhere where there was a strong uh, suite of, of, of research uh, people working on this area. And so I ended up applying to go to the University of California in Davis, which is a fairly uh, uh, significant institution in the US for agricultural research. And there got initiated to basically a, a lot of molecular biology and using uh, studying in this case, uh, the, the transposable elements, so these mobile pieces of DNA and how they can impact the genome. And so that carried me through both the master's and PhD. And eventually when I was looking for uh, postdoctoral training, I migrated over to the UK where um, Caroline Dean's group was involved in both studying flowering and uh, transposable elements in Arabidopsis. And I viewed that Arabidopsis was going to be an important tool at the time, you know, we just didn't have the capacity to do a lot of genomics on crop species because the genomes were so huge. And the only crop or the only plant, I should say, where we had some chance of carrying out some functional analysis was the model uh, plant Arabidopsis. And so I got training in that. And when I took up my position 30 years ago, at Laval University, then I started working again on this model species. And uh, again, because of my interest in breeding, I felt that looking at DNA repair and DNA recombination were uh, topics that were largely uh, unexplored in, in plants. It was mostly the yeast community that was interested in this, but very little work in, in plants. And so got uh, busy with that. Being in a plant science department in an agronomy setting, um, I felt more and more the need to move towards more significant crop species as time went by and as tools became more available in terms of making meaningful uh, discoveries and contributions in cultivated species. And that therefore explains why I migrated with time over into the crop genomics area with emphasis on, on soybean and barley because of their importance in the local economy and the industrial partners that we could find within grower groups, within private companies that had needs basically where uh, the expertise that I, I had gained could be put to good use basically. And so that sort of uh, explained how we, we moved into that specific area. So I hope that gives a, a good idea of my uh, sort of professional uh, evolution there over some 35 years. Are you on mute? I can't hear you right now. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Actually, by mid eighties, like uh, that time, like when DNA was like, they are well, like I don't know. I mean, that time I I could see from the literature people are reading about the DNA discovery, and in, uh, like in practical, might be very new things. Like we are doing now the genomic prediction and those kind of things. So, so yeah, that is like uh, yeah, great to move on. So, this is another follow up. Uh, what motivated you to build a career in plant science? So it's more or less, uh, you already answered it. Uh, if you would like to a little bit elaborate on it, otherwise uh, it's okay. So I can move it uh, another question. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I covered that point to some extent, you know, without uh, sort of going into uh, too, too, too deep uh, details that will probably not be of great interest to the majority of the uh, audience here. So yeah, so I would uh, like to go for like another question. According to you, which sector of plant science research will prosper in the near future? Uh, I'm I'm really you know when I look at the landscape right now, um, 
I think that we have to really invest a lot more of our brain power, if you will, in better develop, developing better technologies to actually do phenotyping. And so, you know, we've made these humongous strides in genomics in, in our ability to characterize the genetic makeup of, you know, any living organism. And that's, that's a great thing. And that's, but, you know, we've achieved that. And I think it's, it's become very affordable and, and, and suitable to many contexts. But when we think about phenotyping, you know, a lot of the work is still go, done go, go, going out in the field, taking a ruler and measuring, oh, this plant is so many centimeters high. It, it's the same technology that was used probably 2000 years ago. And so, you know, we, we haven't made as significant, I think, a leap in terms of our ability to harness and to collect uh, significant and precise data from the field. And so I think right now that, that is uh, starting to happen with all sorts of uh, innovative uh, technologies, either using drones or other types of uh, uh, deployed sensors of many types to gather this large amount of information. But then another challenge that will come is that we're going to be facing just <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> extremely large data sets. And so anything that has to do with intelli artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, to link these amounts of information is going to be very, very crucial. Now, one of the points maybe I, I would like to make, and I think is, is, is a hopeful one, is that throughout much of my career, I have trained many, many graduate students from developing countries. And one of my greatest frustrations was that they would come to Canada, get training in molecular genetics, some area in crop genomics, and go back to their home country and be very limited in how they could exploit their newly acquired expertise and knowledge. Because going back to you know, DNA marker technologies where you had to you know, use radioactivity, or have access to all sorts of consumables like enzymes and this and that, the capacity to carry out that type of work autonomously was sometimes very limiting. And so people would end up not truly being able to fully uh, exploit their, their knowledge and capacities. Today, what really uh, I, I find very uh, encouraging with the genomic revolution is that we hardly do anything uh, of that sort in the lab. A lot of this is contracted out to basically sequencing platforms. And these platforms, all they need is that you provide them with either DNA or a library, things that are achievable and the costs are you know, less prohibitive than they used to be. So I think today, a well-trained person uh, that can have access to the data generate some amount of data is much better equipped, I think, to uh, apply their newly acquired knowledge in the context of their home country and make a difference in terms of helping uh, to, to improve you know, the situation for local growers and, and consumers, basically. So for me, there, there's really a ray of hope and light in the fact that these technologies make um, this type of work much, much more uh, accessible from wherever you are <clears throat> in the world, as long as you have a computer and can run some analysis and connect to a server to do you know, large scale analysis. It's really what's in your head that's the most important and not so limiting as uh, the consumables used to be. Yeah, it's very enriching. I mean, if uh, if you would like to summarize this, so uh, in your opinion, the phenotyping uh, should be focused more in terms of the technology, like we should make some efforts there, and plus the data science, uh, as uh, yeah. if we can say, these are the two one which is uh, uh, most important uh, yeah. coming future. Yeah. So yeah, I would like to move for another question that is uh, more of my personal question. How should a scholar handle long period, or long period uh, of experimental failures and unsuccessful events? 
Well, unfortunately, that's that's the reality of research. And so I always uh, I had a, a meeting recently with a, a head of the, the the teaching labs in our department, and I was telling her that you know you spend mounds of time putting together these very detailed protocols that ensures that a student, any student in the lab course will succeed in you know, doing a PCR or whatever it is that they're tasked with doing. And I said, that's terrible for us in research because the students then graduate into research labs and they're all disappointed and, and, and so challenged by the fact that it doesn't always work. And there's a lot of failure on a daily basis uh, that we have to contend with. And I'll always remember a graduate student that was very talented. And after her master's thesis, she told me that she wasn't interested in moving uh, on to the PhD. And I asked her, well, you know, what gives? And she says, I can't deal with all the failures. And she, you know, had a very nice project. Things had worked out. But she became aware that on a daily basis, we do face a lot of negative results, negative outcomes that require us to, you know, put our brains to work and say, well, what's the problem here? What's happening? Solve it, overcome it. And in the end, we tell the nice story in our thesis. Oh, this is, you know, this is what happens. But that's probably 10% of the work. The other 90% was, uh, you know, dealt with dealing with failures and everything else. And so I think that uh, these types of challenges are inherent with the research endeavor. And then if you find that you yourself uh, have, th this is too difficult to deal with on a daily basis, then I would say, well, maybe this is not your line of work because you really have to be able to deal with it. Otherwise you'll be very unhappy. Um, then the other portion is to say, well, okay, we will encounter problems. How do we solve them? And I think that one of the greatest challenges that I see when I interact with uh, students is to properly train them in how to deal with these issues. And sometimes uh, students are, are, especially in the genomic field, they get um, overly subservient to computers and algorithms. And so they have an unlimited faith and confidence in the output of any sort of computer tool. The computer must be right. Well, the computer is going to be right if the inputs are right. But if there's a problem there, the outputs are going to be bad. And you have to really maintain a very uh, a high level of critical thinking, have expectations. Are these expectations that are based on logic and understanding, are these met by the outcome of your, whatever analysis you're conducting? You need to have some expectations that are reasonable that you can examine on a small scale and say, well, is this turning out? And if it's not the case, if you're getting these unreasonable results, you need to really question the outcome of that analysis and go back and re-examine well, what is it that was put in, was this the right analysis? Was it the right data? Were there uh, mistakes that were made in my code or something else? And, and, and so that's, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a challenge and obviously failure or, or negative results are, are an inherent part of the research endeavor. And there's something we, you know, we have to deal with. And similarly at a professional level, you know, I don't, I don't succeed in funding all of the grant proposals that I put forward. We have to live, uh, same thing, you submit a manuscript, sometimes they're you know, turned down. And if you can't deal with that rejection in a way, you know, then maybe this is not your line of work because I, I think there are relatively few professions uh, where we are so often evaluated by our peers in a number of ways. And so if you uh, can't take criticism or can't take rejection, then it's going to be a painful experience. And so again, you, you have to, to have the right mindset to, to be uh, happy and successful in, in the research world. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is going to help many of us for sure. Uh, so the next question, uh, what are your thoughts on climate change and the global warming impact uh, on agriculture? 
So yeah, well, I'm not a climate scientist, and so all I can do is, like many people, um, basically listen to what the experts are telling us. Uh, I myself can see the impacts in terms of weather patterns over my lifetime. So I'm, I'm much older probably than most of you. And I can see that we've had in my area major shifts in terms of weather patterns in May, June compared to August, September, October. And so this is obviously a new reality. You know, it's not a one-time thing. It's, it's really a long-term trend that we're seeing. And so it, it really uh, invites us working in the uh, breeding side of things to consider these changes. And I think that, that you know, breeders have no choice but to, to adapt in the sense that um, the results of the performance of their lines in uh, relevant environments is what is the foundation for a line being recommended for commercialization. And so if they're not adapting their material. And so in Canada, for example, now people are very concerned about drought resistance. It's something that, you know, I would have never thought 30 years ago because drought wasn't, you know, the main problem in Canada or heat tolerance or things like that. You know, we're more into cold tolerance. Uh, so these are new realities. They're inescapable. Uh, we don't have much control over uh, their, their, how they impact us. And I like to, to say when, when people, um, there's this sort of this naive uh, sort of uh, inclination to think, well, well, in soybeans, for example, we say, oh, if it gets warmer in Canada, why don't we just take varieties that were developed for the, the Midwest and the US? And as it gets warmer in Canada, we'll use those. The problem with that thinking is that soybeans are sensitive to day length. And day length is not changing. The sun is still, you know, where it is and the earth is still revolving in the same way. And so you just do not have the same day length in the Midwest, whereas up, you know, in some regions of Canada. And so having a lion that's adapted to those warmer climates and just simply transporting it into a more Northern environment, it doesn't make sense because the day length will not, uh, uh, will affect differently uh, that plant and so adaptation is a key challenge but obviously you know in the context of adaptation and and mitigation of climate change again to me phenotyping big data are going to be uh, drivers of uh, our efforts to try to uh, again breed crops that are better suited to to be adapted to these new uh, new, new conditions mm -hmm. And the same uh, is the next follow up with the same questions. What is your opinion opinion on food security and the efforts being made to attain it? Yeah, you know, food security is just a hugely complex. It you know we in, in agriculture we tend to bit, tend to think of the supply side, and so obviously you know producing enough food. Various estimates show that, you know, on a worldwide basis, we already produce more than enough food for everyone. And so it's not just a question of production, but it's also how do we make this food uh, available and accessible to, you know, more people. Um, on a hopeful note, I, I think sometimes we tend to forget this. Um, there has been some tremendous progress made in terms of food security. When I was uh, a child um, in school, you know, we used to think about, we were told that, oh, we have to think about the poor people in some areas of the world that live off a bowl of rice every day and that's their only food. And headlines were filled with, there's a famine here, there's a famine there. Uh, and in our minds, you know, famine was affecting a large portion of the world. And I think that India is certainly a country that has had experience, it's quite fair share of such uh, uh, situations. And there have been tremendous gains made in terms of providing people with, you know, what's strictly necessary. So I think there, there has been progress. Now, the other aspect I think that comes into play is, well, what are we using to feed ourselves? And so we're all aware that, you know, consumption of meat especially red meat, 
is extremely taxing on the environment. And so as we be, move forward, I think that certainly in the developed countries, there needs to be a transition towards a more sustainable uh, diet, um, not only for environmental reasons, but health reasons, because obviously I think that uh, uh, plant-based diets uh, uh, have uh, great uh, uh, qualities to them in terms of uh, sustaining a healthy lifestyle. And so I, I think it's just such a, a broad, broad, broad question. Every area can make obviously uh, contributions uh, to that. I think that certainly on the plant science side, we can strive to, to help develop varieties that are more resilient, less reliant on external inputs. Uh, in soybean, we're fortunate that we have biological nitrogen fixation. That uh, means that it's a huge reduction in terms of the carbon footprint because we don't need to uh, apply nitrogen fertilizer. And so it's, it's things like that that I think need to be uh, exploited to, uh, to uh, help us uh, gain the upper hand on this, but it's, it's going to take more than uh, plant science research to help solve these problems. So uh, if we would like to, like in your opinion, like as you said, food security definitely is a big term. So you talk about like plant-based diets, so nutritional security we are talking, or also we are looking for the environmental health. So if you would like to give a percentage for the food security, nutritional security in the current scenario, what would you like, what is your, how would you divide that? What, how much important food security or nutritional security? Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not sure I would divide it maybe so, so neatly. I, I, I think that, you know, when, when people uh, decide to uh, go on a career path and, and choose uh, uh, an area, they have to have some personal connection to it. They, it has to drive them. So I think each one needs to follow their own inclination. And thanks to the diversity that's present in the human population, I think that uh, we can hope that the different needs are met. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you have to try to orient your research to make it relevant. I think certainly in the applied sciences that we have to question our relevance on a regular basis as things evolve. And uh, I, you know, then after that, it, it really, you know, if I were to you say, well, I have to do chromosomal research and microscopy. I, you know, even if that were my finding, I'm afraid that I'm just a horrible microscopist. I hate it. And so I would not be a good micro, you know, researcher in, let's say, cytogenetics. And mm -hmm. so even if it were my understanding that the future of the world was in cytogenetics, I would not be the right person to, to deal with that. So I think you still have to consider your own personal inclinations and strengths and, and say, well, where can I be most useful and, and find fulfillment because obviously we all want to be happy growing, getting up in the morning and say, I'm excited to go at work, to interact with exciting people. And I think that's a key part of having a productive professional life is to be satisfied with what you're doing. And if you're you know, doing it because on paper, somebody says that, oh, the future of the world is on this. If it's not to your meet your strengths and you know you're you're probably not going to be very satisfied in that area yeah that's really very how to say uh, for us i mean when we listen you yeah we we are not talking like just uh, we are uh, listening the experience what you faced and what we uh, what what can guide us i mean in terms of research and everyday work so the next question is um, what is your opinion on the GM crops and their future? Yeah, well, I, I you know, I think genetic modification, I, I, I don't like the term so much just because for all of human history, um, breeding has been about doing genetic modification either through the capture of naturally occurring variants or through the engineering of traits. Mm -hmm. um, to me, uh, genetic engineering, genetic transformation, um, these are tools that are at our disposal. Um, I think they can be valuable tools in some circumstances. 
for example, um, my personal sort of view on this is that we should try to exploit the naturally existing variation in terms of breeding or introducing traits of interest into our crops. But we have to recognize that sometimes that trait or that desired level of a trait may not be available within the existing genetic diversity of a crop. And using external inputs, such as DNA coming from a foreign uh, organism, is one way to achieve what could be a, a quite desirable goal. Now, that's in theory, then there's the practical applications in terms of what are we doing with the technology and what are the impacts. Now, obviously, in the context where a lot of this technology is in private hands and the public sector has more or less been sidelined, and a lot of that has to do with the very, very um, strict regulations and, and demands of the regulatory framework that it's it's sort of put all public research uh, out you know out out uh, out of the game and I think that's that's quite unfortunate I think there would be a greater diversity and maybe more research in the public interest if a, a broader set of researchers were involved I'm hopeful that maybe with the uh, gene editing uh, technologies that we're seeing. Uh, today that there will be a broader place for uh, the public sector to continue to contribute to this area. But I would think it would be an, a mistake to view um, genetic transformation as some sort of inherent evil. Um, you know, it's like I, I tell people when they think about the regulatory aspects, there are some unique features to a technology like this. So if we want to put on the market a microwave, well, we need to make sure that the microwave technology is safe. And once we've established that, then whether you buy a Panasonic or a whatever brand of microwave, it's the same thing. Genetic modification is not like that. You cannot give a blanket assurance that all genetic modification will always be safe. It's a case by case examination. Some applications will be found to be safe. Some applications will be found to be unsafe. And it's that very, and, and, and that's complex and people want to have a simple picture. And so some activists, you know, paint a very dark picture and say, oh, this is all bad. I think unfortunately too much focus has been placed on traits that are relevant to growers and, and I can see where that's natural. I mean, the, the client, the customer for a, a seed company is the grower. And so the seed company wants to develop traits that will be relevant and attractive to growers. But if we had more traits that were focused towards the ultimate consumer, then the consumer would have a, maybe have the sense that they are benefiting from the technology. Right now, I don't think there's much uh, there are many consumers that feel that they themselves are direct benefactors of this technology, and they are told that there is some risk to themselves or the environment. And so taking a risk without benefit is not a very good proposal. So mm -hmm. there are doubts about, you know, cell phones. Are, can they cause problems in your brain because of the waves and this and that? There, you know, there are some uncertainties there. But I don't know many people that would forego the use of a cell phone simply because it brings them so much practicality that they have benefits, tangible benefits that they're willing to take on some risk, whatever they perceive that risk to be. In the case of GM technology, we're basically asking consumers to take on a risk without offering them much of a very tangible benefit, something that talks to them and so I think that's part of the challenge in this case. Yeah, very well explanatory. Uh, like uh, then people, I, uh, especially the students, can understand why GM crop is getting so much uh, uh, discouraged, uh, discouraged by so many people, and uh, why it is so um, activist, activist uh, participated, uh, and uh, why it is like in, especially in some countries, uh, not accepted. 
Right. So uh, that leads to the second part of the question. So your ethics and training the next generation. So could you please give us some suggestions on how to maintain professional collaborations? Yeah, well, I think at, at the heart of all of it in terms of collaboration is it needs to come from the base. I have never believed that some official in a ministry could say, hey, we're going to bang heads together and get the people working on artificial intelligence to come with the crop genomics and force them to work. Together. And that'll be, wow, a miraculous output. Fruitful collaboration stems from people having affinities and wanting to work together. And so I think that when we think about building a uh, professional network of collaborators, I think you really have to consider very, very deeply the human aspect of things. I mean, if you do not get along with a potential collaborator, um, forget it. it. It just won't work because you need to benefit mutually and have pleasure in working together. And so I think many times, I think the human aspect of things uh, can be neglected by graduate students. I always tell graduate students that come into my office asking, you know, can I study uh, in, in, can I join your group and this and that? And I always tell them, you know, please take the time to really consider how, what is your assessment of our interactions? Nobody, no matter what their qualities as a communicator can be universal in their capacity to efficiently convey messages and, and interact with another human being. And so that just does not exist, the universal donor. And so people have to sense that they have, they're in the same wavelength at the person they're interacting with, both in terms of communication and human, on the human side of things. Mm -hmm. And if you are not comfortable with somebody, don't make them your supervisor. That is not going to be a recipe for success because it's a very challenging time in, in, in a person's life going through grad school. As you mentioned earlier, lots of uh, 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 pitfalls and, and, and uh, obstacles that come in the way. And, and you need to be in an environment where you, know, you get the support you need and uh, be attentive to what people in the surroundings are saying. If the people say, hey, I last met my advisor six months ago, I would say that's probably not a very good sign. So you need to be aware of, you know, what, talk to people in, that are already in the lab. What are they experiencing? How, how has their uh, supervisory experience been with this person? Are you a good fit with this person? And I think I, I tend to tell students that should be at least 50% of your choice is do I sense that there is a connection with this person and can I work fruitfully? And I always end this conversation by saying, remember, when you submit your thesis, somebody has to sign it and that's me. And so if I don't like you, somehow that may affect you know, my willingness to, to go forth. And I, I don't mean it as, you know, a, a threat. It, it's just the reality of human relationships that if you, you know, have trouble uh, interacting with somebody, maybe you'll be less inclined to go the extra mile to help that person out. And that's just human nature. And, and we would like to be, you know, uniform in how we treat everybody. But I think it goes both ways. And we have to sense that, that, you know, there's a connection there. Hopefully, when uh, students are, are, are looking around for different uh, teams to, to join, you know, they're not focused and their life is not dependent upon, oh, I need to get in this lab. If I don't get in this lab, it's the end of my life. It shouldn't be the case. You know, curious people should find interest in a number of endeavors and let yourself be guided, yes, by your interest in a topic, but don't underestimate the importance of finding a welcoming environment where you know, people that are doing what you hope to be doing seem to be happy doing it and not you know, as slave labor, basically. Yeah, actually, uh, indeed, like there are so many uh, PhD comics made out of this because of those kind of uh, 
frictions or so kind of not, as you said, the frequency is not matching between students and the professor. So sometimes the, it is also like there is a time limit for that. Uh, uh, deadlines are there uh, for graduate students and they have uh, uh, some, uh, and also in research, you are not getting, like you should have so many plan A, B, C, D, and also the bypass plan where you can uh, uh, accelerate your things. Uh, but some, there is also conflict of interest between. So what is your opinion for, opinion for that? I mean, how to resolve that? If something happened like that, yeah. Well, I mean, that's always. I mean, nobody uh, wishes that on anybody. Um, I think, depending on you know the circumstances, then you have to possibly seek out some neutral arbiters. You know, if there is a conflict that comes up, um, somebody external to the situation that can possibly be helpful in terms of uh, alleviating or, or finding some sort of a, a truce or agreement between the people. It could be a department chair or a head of the uh, graduate program and in different universities. It can be an ombudsman that's in charge of basically making sure that everybody's rights are, are respected. But I think you, you want to handle it initially um, at the first level and, and, and try to, to, to find a reasonable accommodation with the, uh, the, the, the people directly involved. Um, as soon as things escalate to a higher level, then sometimes it can bring up some uh, personal grievances that uh, make uh, finding agreements more difficult, but it unfortunately does happen. And there are uh, fortunately mechanisms in, in, in most graduate settings that I'm aware of where uh, people can get help in terms of uh, making sure that their, their rights are, are respected and, and that they're, uh, they, they you know, get the required uh, the, the supervision that they're entitled to. Okay. So I think that is very inform um, that is very good information uh, students are collecting today. Uh, so how to deal with it. So I would move, uh, next question is when, when you uh, interview to hire a researcher or fellow, what qualities do you look for other than academics? Yeah. Um... Like, like I said, I, I, I think you, you, you have to feel that, you know, you're able to communicate with the person, that you feel their energy and desire to, to, to work. Uh, I personally have, um, let's say, a, 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 I am very intolerant of people that don't seem to know why they're there. I mean, if somebody doesn't uh, seem to, to really have a strong sense of self-motivation. Uh, that to me is a big turnoff. I think that um, it, it, th there is somewhat of a challenge in the sense that some graduate students are maybe there for the wrong reasons. So uh, people may be pursuing graduate work because, for example, they're afraid of the labor market and feel insecure about, you know, the professional opportunities say, well, I'm used to school, I'm good in school, why not continue? That's not a good enough reason to be going mm -hmm. into research in graduate school. Uh, I've encountered situations where social pressures uh, from family members uh, saying, well, you know, it'd be good on your CV if you had a graduate degree. Uh, I've known of countries that, uh, you know, will only reward people that have certain degrees. And so there may be uh, motivation factors that fall outside the personal motivation and really are external. And, you know, when things get tough, I think these people will find it very hard to overcome the challenges that you alluded to earlier. And we don't work in a world where we punch from nine to five, you know, punch in the morning, punch out in the evening. In research, the brain is always preoccupied with these things. And if, if you're not in it for the right reasons, I think it will be hard to be successful because you, you have to be constantly sort of aware and thinking about these things. And that's has some fortunate sides, some unfortunate sides for people living with us. Sometimes to see us thinking about our science when we're taking our shower in the morning. 
hard to understand, but that's that's the reality of it. So again, going back to your point about the interviews, I really looking for people that seem to be passionate, want to be curious, they want to, to be in it for the right reasons. Uh, I think that to me is a really key selling point. And when you hire, so it's like you, you could see the some cultural differences from the Asian countries, African countries, and in Canada itself, like in America. So what kind of uh, qualities you look for in that way? Well, certainly, you know, when you're, you, it depends who you're hiring. So if you're hiring, for example, a research assistant, you know, these, these people are literally your right arms, you know, they're, they're, they're an extension of you in terms of uh, um, enacting your vision of what you would like to be able to achieve. And so you have to feel a, a total confidence in uh, their abilities, their judgment, their, you know, willingness to go the extra mile. And so, you know, that's one particular situation because these are people that are going to be hired typically for as long as you can pay them. And so you, you want to make sure that they have certain qualities. In, in students, well, you, you have to be more tolerant in the sense that, you know, you can't necessarily expect all students to be all things to, to, to you in the same way. And so you have to have a somewhat of a broader uh, view of, of, you know, what, you, you expect them to be. And so it really depends on, you know, at what level you're recruiting and, and what reasonable expectations can be uh, from those areas. So, but to, to give an example, you know, I've, I've encountered situations. So one of my longest held research assistants is a woman uh, and she has a PhD and she's a very, very competent person. And I've encountered situations where people um, male students were not used to interacting with and maybe taking direction from a, a, a female superior. So in those cases, you know, you just have to be clear, say, you know, well, this is how things are here. And I'm sorry, but if, if this is not suitable for you, or you can't work in that environment, then, you know, here's the door because, you know, this is how things operate here. And, and I would ask you to, you know, to accept that and, and adapt to it. If not, then, you know, it, it has to be a limit somewhere to uh, how, uh, how far inclusion will go in this sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, yeah, you are the reviewer of for many renowned journals. Can you give us some key takeaways, uh, takeaway messages for the students to improve manuscripts? Yeah, I think that you have to remember, well, first of all, I mean, writing a manuscript for a graduate student, you know, it's, it's not a self-taught skill. You should have help in doing this. Nobody can learn to ride a bike on their own. They need somebody to hold the rear seat there and give them a push and, and you know, and so you, you don't try to do this on your own. Some students are uh, inhabited by this strong sense of wanting to be autonomous, and wanting to show that they can do this, but it, it's a difficult task and, and nobody can be self-taught. And so you need to really seek assistance in terms of, of doing this. Um, try to, <coughs> when you read papers, what do you enjoy? What, what, in your view, makes a good paper? And what makes a bad paper? And try to emulate the better examples try to get tips on, oh, I, this is a really clear way of doing things and I need to adhere to that. Another common mistake I think that graduate students make, it's to think that a manuscript is the place to tell people all that they did. Well, no, no, it's not the case. You're there to tell them a scientific story of sorts where this is what I had as a starting hypothesis, this was I did to test. These are the relevant results that were used to determine whether or not my hypothesis held true or not. All the experiments that were done on the side and giving you guidance as to how we you know, arrive there, they're not relevant and of interest to the reader. And so it's not a taking your notebook, your lab notebook, say, I'm going to put everything that's in there into my paper. No, you just really need to think what's of interest here in the work that I have done and what are the relevant pieces that belong in there. 
And then after that, then again, like I said, I think that you know there are courses that are offered in universities on scientific writing, but ultimately the responsibility in my view lies heavily with the supervisor and the, the team of people that are supervising students to help them acquire those skills because they want to be acquired on their own. And sometimes the student face problem with the duplication, like they follow some protocol and they have a lot of duplications uh, rather than uh, to show the nobility in a paper, manuscripts. So uh, they are not able to publish it. So many times they ask the questions like how to deal with this situation if they don't find any nobility, just don't publish. Well, I mean, in today's environment, I would argue that you can publish anything. I mean, there's just this huge proliferation of all sorts of journals and some of them complete trash. I don't see there being many limits to what's being published. There's just a lot of an abundance of things being published. But obviously when you're doing research, you should concern yourself with what you're having a good understanding of what you're doing. And there's nothing wrong with replicating uh, results that have already been published in the sense that you know, you, there is a need and a relevance to showing that this situation is also the case in this or that crop. But then you have the understanding that obviously that won't have the same impact and the same um, attractivity to the high impact journals in terms of uh, the novelty of the thing. That doesn't mean it's not useful and should not be shared, but one has to have a good, under <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> <laughs> understanding of you know what the relative positioning of their research is and i don't think that all research is suitable to be published i mean sometimes you know just you do something and the results you find are not that interesting and you know i don't think that we should strive to publish every single tidbit of what it is that we do mm -hmm. so that leads to the last question uh, what would your words of wisdom to the student and scholar who are new to the field of plant science research? I, I, you, you go back to the basics, you know, re, really uh, do some introspection and, and, and certainly for somebody that's just at the very, very beginning of their path is to really, you know, question themselves as to whether or not, you know, this is the right area for them. And so they, I think being deeply, deeply self-motivated is uh, a key factor in terms of, you know, the outcome and the success of your career because we're constantly learning new things. And if you don't have the interest and curiosity to keep yourself abreast of what's happening in your area, I think you, you know, it, it won't be very successful. And so again, and we're not factory workers, you know, you don't punch in the morning and say, I have so many shirts to stitch together. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a lot of it comes down to self-motivation, how curious you are relative to the questions that you're, you're uh, being uh, challenged with, uh, how much you will on your own decide to invest yourself in finding answers to those questions. I think those are the, the key drivers. And I would certainly hope that, that young students would uh, uh, do that self-examination and make sure that they're there in that area and that level of training for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of uh, interview session. So yeah, Shubo, would you like to take questions from the chat or? Sir, I, I have pasted all the questions related to your talk specifically. Uh, Shoma, is it possible for you to read out few one uh, or uh, specifically said there um, the gist of most of the questions where I am not uh, collected, those are wanted to collaborate with you. <laughs> Their purpose is to interact with you and maybe the most of the PhD students or most uh, of the graduate students. So they are asking for how to join your lab. Well, maybe a word of caution first. You have to realize that maybe by just examining my name, you may guess that my, my first language is French. 
And uh, I live in a part of Canada where French is the spoken language. And so if somebody were to uh, come here for a master's or PhD, all the coursework would be in French. And so that I think would probably impact some people. Somebody like Priyanka at the postdoctoral level is, is not so much of an issue because there's no coursework and so on and so forth. But for others, I think that would be a, a, a key consideration. So I think it's, I always tell students, you know, especially, you know, I guess in India, English is very broadly spoken, but when you have people, let's say from China, and you say, well, if you come here, not only do you have to become proficient in English to be familiar with the literature and all this, but on top, you have to learn another language. Uh, you know, it, it builds up layers of, of challenge and difficulty. And so I think that's, that's one aspect of things that people need to keep into, in mind, but people do it. And so it, it does happen. So uh, there, there, there are websites that can guide you towards, you know, admission procedures, uh, uh, application forms, and this and that. And so it's always useful to, to have some idea what are the general considerations in terms of admission at Laval University. And then you can always get in, in touch with me and, and see what opportunities are there, because most of the student positions that uh, we fill are those that are funded through our research grants. And so obviously our capacity to host students is based on our funding capacity itself, other than people getting scholarships, which in this environment are not always that numerous. And so, especially for international students, we really have to fund them on our own. And so that's uh, an additional uh, uh, limitation to how many uh, people we can take uh, at any given time. Thanks, sir. And uh, one category of questions is the availability of the uh, Shoavin varieties, like some uh, uh, from Pakistan, uh, one participant asked that uh, heat tolerance Shoavin is it available in uh, Pakistan and those are not GM, means uh, traditional heat tolerance Shoavin, is it available in right. Pakistan? I would, I would say for people that have very direct questions like that about genetic mm -hmm. materials, the, top, yes. the best people to ask would be the actual breeders mm -hmm. that are, you know, heading programs. They have access to a, a broad range of germplasm and sometimes have collaborations <clears throat> in other countries and are aware of their material, for example, being tested uh, in other uh, places. So I think that the, the best uh, uh, yes. people to, to, to contact would be the soybean mm -hmm. breeders in Canada or elsewhere and to ask for, you know. Yes, uh, yes. And same, breeders. same similar questions by Dr. Kriti Tanwali. Uh, he is asking for the yellow mosaic virus disease registration uh, access in, in India. So the same answer is that you need to ask someone who work on that particular yes. rate or uh, contact through the uh, gene bank accessions is if it is available for the farmers or not. And so there is another type of questions. Uh, um, those are working for the availability of data. And I'm sure you mentioned it. And it's also a publicly available with the paper you have published in that data. Right. That is the genome sequencing of Schwabin freely available and where? So I think uh, it, it, well, it, it I, I would, uh, direct people towards, you, as you mentioned, the, the research papers, and there's always a section on data availability, and mm -hmm. these have links to international repositories of different mm -hmm. levels of genetic information, could be the direct reads themselves, or it mm -hmm. could be the more highly processed uh, catalogs of SNPs and structural variants. So that, fortunately, I, I think that's a, a great strength of the soybean research community worldwide is that there's a great level of uh, uh, collaboration to ensure that the uh, data are widely available on these public databases. And uh, just I want to add with you for the young participants that uh, don't meet the supplementary data sections. It's more valuable than the uh, those paper where the more, many, many things are put on the supplementary data. So it's also the part of the paper. Don't overlook it. Sometimes you can find your experimental designing related answer like primer sequence, TM, or how platform, what is the pipeline we have used for the data mining that all are goes to the supplementary data section. So don't uh, uh, 
uh, don't bypass these sections. It is also important nowadays. Your supplementary data sections also give the de depository details. And if there is a password, username, ID, also are available in supplementary. And uh, so these are the main type of questions. And one particular question, I, I think you have, a, uh, you have a slide on that. That's why this question came up and that uh, uh, please, uh, uh, no, that, that is not, that, uh, that is the related to, huh, yes, the second one. Um, Amjit Khan is asking that yield versus maturity have the direct relation. Is this relation due to availability of light hours or degree days? Well, I, from a physiological point of view, obviously plants that are out in the field exposed to sunlight, harvesting energy from the sun for mm -hmm. a longer period of time are available to convert more of that free energy into things, photosynthesis that go into seed. And so obviously the, the, there's a direct relationship between maturity and yield in most crops that I'm aware of, as long as you maintain good adaptation to your environment. And so that's uh, a, an inescapable uh, truth of, of, of you know, plant physiology is that uh, uh, there's always going to be or typically going to be a very strong link between maturity and potential yield. Thanks, sir. And uh, uh, that, that's, that's about the uh, questions uh, we have collected. And, and uh, you can guess that our students, uh, our audience are most of the younger students like uh, have masters and PhDs. So they are, uh, they, they are very much appreciated to your talk. And most of people are wanted to like join your team <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the, that type of uh, people. Uh, I see many people like that feelings. Uh, it is your work and your presentation. I, 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 I learn many things from your presentation personally that how to present your data and uh, how to minimize the questions also because you you given the answer in that way. So it's a nice presentation technique. It's uh, very much yeah, learning. There's to us. another good lesson for graduate students. There is yes. no one way to make a presentation. It's all dependent on your audience. So the very first question mm. you should ask yourselves when you're preparing your slides, slides. Is yes. who am I talking to? If yes. I'm presenting before a group of growers, mm. seed companies, research scientists it's not the same audience and it's mm. not the same presentations and slides give. and so i think that's something that uh, mm. uh, and be more careful of being understood than to impress people i think it's a natural mm. tendency mm. for students to be afraid that mm. what they will explain is too simplistic mm. and, and and not you know impress everybody by the wealth of it be understood. That is the key point of communication. If you present mounds of data, nobody understands it. Nobody is better off. So uh, hopefully yes. that uh, is a yes. And knowing specific of the gray beard. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And uh, yes, and specifically when this type of data, uh, like uh, the genomic data or in silico analysis data, then then there should be that your approach is a perfect because uh, many times we also um, think that uh, what is the interpretations of that? Because sometimes we focus on our results and miss the others' perspective and thinking process. So it's a great learning thing. And obviously by scientific, uh, it's, it's a great top notch and uh, it's all, you cover everything and try to cover, make a circle of science, growers, cultivars, variety. And it's, it's a great thing to learn for our, like those are younger uh, in, this, in this field. And your presentations was great. Many people are appreciated in their forms. Uh, um, many others uh, wanted to uh, listen to you more and more in this platform. And we also expect in future, uh, if you have uh, an opportunity, we have an opportunity. We, we again we go for 
such type of fruitful discussions sessions and uh, it's dedicated to that session was dedicated to your research and it will be available on on uh, youtube and it's it's going to be uh, more more uh, fruitful in near future uh, right. thanks thanks for accepting our invitations and thanks for priyanka uh, because uh, I, I, otherwise priyanka i can't i maybe i maybe not able to contact you so uh, i thanks priyanka he was a great uh, present uh, scientist and opportunity to learn many things uh, uh, through this bioengine platform and for the audience we try to make some more uh, such type of uh, presentations from uh, great uh, people those are uh, renowned and do more than 30 30 40 years of the science so they are uh, know what to do how to do and what not to do so, uh, and that is the important for us that what not to do like uh, sir just told about the presentation technique with the science thanks sir this is uh, this is a great you hearing you is a, a great opportunity for us so much, Priyanka and uh, sir, of course, thank you so much. And we hope to see you again. <laughs> Great. Have a good Great. Evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor uh, Francois Balzi. See you. Bye-bye.